Thanks very much, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, special thanks to you, Ian, and Ken L. Gates. It's nice to be back. It's got to be the best view of St. Paul's, isn't it, uh, in the city, really, I think. Uh, my name is Chris Southworth. I'm the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce here in the UK. Uh, we haven't done much on fraud for a little while, so we thought this would be a good topic to kind of kick us off in the trade finance space uh, this time of year. There's plenty to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk first with a, a panel of the great and the good, uh, some of whom have been involved with uh, a set of recommendations that we've put to government. So we're going to talk a little bit about why have we taken that approach. Uh, and then we'll talk, you know, case studies, best practice, and hopefully hear more from you. What are you hearing in the market? Uh, fraud never goes away. The question is, can we kind of prevent it, uh, make it happen less? That's the big challenge we have up available to us. Um, so what I'm going to do is just jump on the panel now, uh, and then there's plenty of time to, to, to talk. But if you have questions, please do ask, uh, either the panel or in the coffee breaks, as Ian said. You know, we're, we're keen to hear from you, and then there's the Q&A and Slido um, to uh, also uh, give you the opportunity to feed back. So, Dave, uh, can you hear? We've got two people on screen here, obviously. We've got T Todd Burwell from BAFT, and we've got Dave Maynell, who's the vice chair of our Trade Finance Committee and technical advisor to the Banking Commission. Dave, can I hand over to you to say a few words? Yeah, can do. Can you hear me, Chris? Yep, all good. Excellent. Um, well, we all know that trade finance has been a, a cornerstone of global commerce for centuries, enabling the smooth flow of goods, services, and capital across borders. However, where there's money, there's often fraud. Trade finance itself, uh, you, most of you are aware, very well aware of this, and its earliest origins in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, where merchants used financial instruments such as promissory notes and letters of credit. Uh, in fact, the Code of Hammurabi, which dates back to 1754 BC, is actually one of the earliest recorded legal documents that mentions trade practices, including, wait for it, regulations against fraudulent behaviour nearly 4,000 years ago. Uh, in classical Greece and Rome, trade expanded significantly, and with it, the sophistication of trade finance instruments. The Greeks used maritime loans, while the Romans developed banking systems and promissory notes. But then we had fraudulent activities, and these included falsifying the quality and quantity of goods, which we still have today, tampering with scales, and issuing counterfeit currency. In fact, the Roman legal system even addressed such fraud through various laws, including the Lex Cornelia de Falsis, which dealt with forgery and fraud. Then we move on to medieval Europe. Uh, we saw fraudulent activity, including counterfeit coins, uh, coins, false documents, and false weights and measures. But importantly, this period also saw the establishment of guilds. And these guilds played a crucial role in regulating trade and addressing fraudulent practices among their members. Then we jump forward time again during the 16th to 18th centuries, the age of exploration, which brought about an explosion in global trade. However, the advent of joint stock companies like the Dutch East India Company also introduced new opportunities of fraud. We saw embezzlement, insider trading, and issuance of fraudulent shares. So it's an age old problem. And today, fraud in trade finance remains a significant challenge. The globalization of trade, the complexity of supply chains, and the rise of digital finance have actually introduced new risks. Cyber fraud, trade-based money laundering, and documentary fraud are among the most pressing issues. And on that note, I'd like to hand back to Chris, as he's now moderating the session on tackling fraud in trade, recommendations to government. Great, thanks very much, uh, Dave. So, um, sorry. Yeah. Um, Sorry, it's the hard wiring you're seeing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit today um, um, about why we have sent out to government a set of recommendations on tackling fraud in trade. We're going to talk a little bit it's bigger than fraud in trade. Obviously, fraud is fraud at the end of the day. Um, uh, we'll start a little bit by just understanding why are we doing that. Uh, in our case, we've got a new government coming in. The call is growth and productivity. Uh, in our view, this is a huge opportunity to do more than just the usual. What we should be doing is pulling every single policy lever across government, uh, including to tackle fraud, 
uh, which in the end just acts as a drag on economic growth and impacts everybody. It's a cost that just gets passed on. The trouble is people don't know it's passed on, uh, and therefore there's no accountability mechanism in the market to change anything much. Uh, however, we do have a window here to get some fresh ideas forward to government, uh, and of course technology has moved forward exponentially really uh, over the course of recent years. There are solutions available to us today uh, that were simply not available to us only a few years ago. Uh, and it's that market infrastructure piece. So we will be talking about case studies a little bit later in the event. Uh, but the opportunity really at the moment is let's look at the fundamentals. What's the infrastructure that we need to make this easier? And I'll just go back to the case that really, really brought this to light for me. And you'll all probably remember it a few years ago. Uh, there was, a, I think it was a steel-based fraud, and it hit the newspapers, 500 million, half a billion uh, pounds of fraud. Uh, some fraudster had gone to 10, 10 banks, got trade finance from 10 banks. Uh, nobody knew about it until it all hit the newspapers uh, as a fraudulent case. Uh, to me, as a non-banker, a policy maker, if you like, that just looked completely ridiculous. Uh, how on earth? Is that allowed to have to, to happen? Uh, and that started off a whole piece of work on shutting fraudsters out of trade. And the culmination of that work, we've published a report in 2022, if you didn't see it, uh, to start to sort of get under the skin of the issue. Uh, one of the issues is there's just not enough data to know what the, what is the scale of this, other than you don't need to be a rocket scientist if you read the newspapers to see that the numbers are big. Uh, and that's probably only the tip of the iceberg to what's really going on out there. Um, the culmination of that work is really what we're going to talk about today. So it hasn't come out of nowhere. It's been a sort of line of thought, investigation, asking questions, going into government, asking questions, going to the regulators and asking questions. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is be practical. Uh, what can we do quite quickly uh, that's not going to cost the government a lot of money because we don't have any? Um, and be able to start to make a difference in, in everyday work that you all do at the end of the day and make your lives easier. So I'm going to start off with Todd. I hope you can hear me. Uh, just to, you with us, Todd? Yes, I can. Yeah. Can you hear me? So just, just the sort of first question um, to Todd, who's, uh, you know, um, very much a sort of part of our community along the, with the likes of, you know, the global ICC and IPFA and other bodies, GLIFE uh, amongst others. Just to give us an idea, just to remind us, what is the impact of fraud on economic growth and productivity, whether that's from a US side, global side? You're, you obviously engage with the UK as well. Uh, can you just sort of set out for us uh, how you see the impact of fraud on the market? Sure. So um, first, thanks for, for having me. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't be with you in person. But um, thanks to technology, I'm there with you in spirit. So, so before I get into the economic impact, I just want to reiterate something that you said, Chris, which is, is important, which is that I think as long as there are human beings who are looking to cheat the system, fraud will exist. So, so I want to lay out an, an understanding that uh, this will never go away, but as long as we want to have integrity in the economic systems that we have, we have to try to protect them. So when I speak about um, financial crime, I often use some words interchangeably, but you know, there's different flavors of financial crime. Fraud is one, trade-based money laundering is another, sanctions avoidance is another, and, and they all have their unique um, ways that they present, right? But there are common factors across all of them. So. So, in, in one instance, the actual parties or the underlying transactions are not who or what was actually represented, right? Another issue is you've got the inability to validate the authenticity of the underlying transactions. And whether that's fraudulent documents, whether that's phantom shipments, whether that's diverted payment instructions, or what have you. And, and a third thing is, the, just the, the natural fragmentation of the ecosystem lends itself 
to be exploited. And that's how you end up with things like duplicate financing and so forth. So, so if you talk about the fundamentals of how do you tackle that, I, you know, there has to be a coordinated effort between the private sector and the government uh, public sector to protect all, all stakeholders, right? And that includes validating the parties that they are who they represent themselves to be. That means validating transactions that they are what they represent themselves to be. And then it means really coordinating our defenses uh, across across the board. So, so I think that's that's the fundamentals of, of what the issue is and how we get there. Now, if you ask me the economic impact, I, I sometimes like to use simple analogies, and and in this case, I think of it as um, you know you have you have a group of people who are loading pumpkins on a truck, right? And so when you want to talk about measuring. The, the impact of fraud on, on, on economic growth. Imagine if you have somebody who's at the back of the truck who's taking the pumpkins off as soon as you load them. I mean, it's pretty clear how you end up losing economic value and how you end up losing um, uh, uh, productivity around that. Now, studies have actually shown more broadly that where you have a higher instance of financial crime, including fraud, that there's overall less opportunities in that market. You've got higher inequality in that market. You've got higher poverty in that market. You've got more illegal immigration. You've got a misuse of, of resources and, in, and a degradation of, of, of the environment. So, so there's, a, there's a huge societal impact that goes along with it. It's not just the economic impact and the productivity. So, you know, there's 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 a list of, of companies that I could individually outline, but from a macro perspective, this is a multi-billion dollar problem. Um, and I think we've got to, you know, clearly coordinate the efforts between the private sector and the public sector to try to get our arms around it. Great, thanks very much, uh, Todd. Um, so I'm going to turn to, to Jai now, um, and let's just start to sort of set the scene for, you know, what we're recommending. Uh, you know, we're not trying to solve and boil the ocean here or solve, solve the world. It's, it's about being practical. But can you just sort of, uh, before, perhaps before we um, talk about the problem that we're trying to solve, uh, this has come from the Trade Digitalization Task Force. Can you just explain what that is and who's involved in it? Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And thanks, Todd, for laying out the, the background so clearly. So the Trade Digitalization Task Force was a culmination of um, a public-private partnership model. So um, Barclays and the Department for Business and Trade signed a five-year partnership to look at how we can increase exports and support UK exports. As part of that, one of the objectives was digitalization of trade, and ICC stepped in to help co-lead uh, a task force around digitalization of trade. So what we have today is a brilliant body of peer banks, uh, lots of industry bodies, so ICC, BAFT, ACT, you know, all, all the industry bodies that we recognize, and a group of other logistics providers and companies that are relevant to the entire trade ecosystem. Um, and the broad objectives of this task force are, one, we had some immediate objectives around capital treatment, so Basel 3.1, and the, the treatment of performance guarantees was one primary concern we had. We addressed that early on and had some early success. So thanks to the government and their efforts in helping put forward our arguments, we, we did have an early win on that front. So it does kind of magnify that when the collective, the collaborative effort goes in, we do have outcomes. Um, the other three objectives are one around fraud risk. So we had early discussions around how we could look at measures to prevent fraud and mitigate the risk of financial crime and efficiencies around financial crime processes are another important pillar. And lastly, but the most important one, digitalization of trade and how we can accelerate the agenda going forward. And early days when we did meet as a task force to talk about fraud, Initially, the discussion was focused on a narrower use case around duplicate invoice financing. Obviously, there were some cases uh, in, in the last few years which highlighted that as, as, an, as a problem area. But very quickly, across the banking group and the industry bodies, we came to the realization that actually that's a small use case. There's lots of different types of fraud typologies that we need to think about and risks we need to address. And individually, as organizations, 
um, we have the responsibility to mitigate risk and we have lots of measures in place individually. We have procedures, controls, policies, name it, you know, the works. And we're all making that individual effort to mitigate the risk of fraud. But collectively, as a collaborative body, we could come together and put forward some recommendations to the government, which is the objective of the task force, put forward recommendations to the government. So that's essentially how this, this dialogue came about. Okay, and, and what's the problem that the, the, the report is actually trying to solve? So, so again, going back to the point I made around um, individually as organizations, as banks, as corporates, we're all, we've got great measures in place to mitigate the risk of fraud, yet fraud is so prevalent. We've had some shocking numbers around fraud and the economic cost. So the, the the problem is we have a lot of data. Data is housed within organizations. A lot of that data is in the form of paper today, unfortunately, in trade. We're, we're still stuck with the paper-based approaches. Um, so that data doesn't get shared across the ecosystem. It doesn't get shared uh, widely between banks. It doesn't get shared with the government. There's no flow of data from the government to us. So the, what we're really trying to solve for is how does one while addressing the data privacy principles, because that is an important topic, how does one address those key concerns, but still create an environment where we, where we could come up with innovative solutions to share data and have systems in place to alert each other. So that's what set the basis for the recommendations of the paper. And, and it's about using existing infrastructure and existing systems in place, but creating that connectivity and creating that dialogue with inviting the government and potentially the regulators to the table to think about what are the innovative approaches we could use? And yeah, that, that's what's culminated in the paper and the recommendations. Great. So Todd, that leads, in, leads into the recommendations. What are we recommending? So I think, you know, the paper is obviously uh, quite, you know, quite comprehensive. I think there's four main recommendations that the, the paper sort of calls out, um, you know, in, in relation to fraud specifically. Um, you know, the goal is to develop solutions that uh, will align to opportunities uh, in making trade cheaper, faster, simpler, and more sustainable and accessible uh, to UK businesses. So I think the driver behind this is, is you know, as far as the uh, task force is concerned, is also in terms of making the UK economy and UK businesses more uh, desirable to do business with for these reasons, right? Um, but the, the recommendations are, are sort of uh, designed uh, to be aligned at an international level, right? So obviously, uh, when it comes to these kinds of, of solutions, it'll need to align with international legal frameworks for information sharing or in terms of standards or you know, other frameworks that are being developed. I think in terms of those four priorities, uh, deeper regulation, cooperation with industry to promote innovation is the first one. Um, there are uh, institutions in the UK, such as the CDDO and the Turing, um, which are, uh, you know, in the, the process of developing uh, more in, you know, innovation and smarter techno technology-based solutions to prevent fraud. Um, and, you know, we need to ensure that when, you know, these, these innovations are being developed, that they are being brought into uh, a sort of strategy for fraud risk mitigation within the UK. Um, I think that's one of the one of the, uh, the, the areas that have been addressed. The second would be standardizing information and connecting government and financial systems. Um, so at the moment, you do have uh, specific engagement uh, with the uh, NECC's Jimlet partnership, so between FIs and Jimlet, um, which is uh, one of the, I think, key uh, sort of areas, uh, whether it's with the City of London Police, HMRC, Serious Fraud Office, and National Crime Agency, et cetera, uh, in terms of information sharing when it comes to uh, fraud risk or financial crime risk uh, events, whether it's SAR filing or some kind of a, um, a lessons learned or thematic uh, in information sharing. But that needs to be connected with something that's quite simple, API, Application Programming Interface, which we've seen done in, in other countries, such as Singapore. They've been quite successful in the retail space in terms of allowing uh, public uh, institutions to plug into um, or private to plug into public. And that's often a requirement of the public ins institutions to require that sort of connectivity. So that can be developed in the UK as well. It just needs to be, as I mentioned earlier, to be, to be raised as a, a proposal. Um, and in terms of public to, to private to private information sharing, uh, the Patriot Act in the US allows for that to happen, right? So it's, it's a product that was born out of 9-11 um, and we have today the uh, Economic uh, Crime and uh, uh, Corporate Transparency Act in the UK that was uh, that was uh, that came out last year. So, how to leverage the the provisions of that act 
to uh, enable institutions to share information between each other, uh, amongst each other when it comes to uh, criminal actors or suspicious patterns. The other one is, uh, I think the third one, the role of companies house. So companies house, as you might all be aware, is undergoing um, a revamp. Uh, and that's sort of commissioned by uh, some government uh, actions last year. Uh, and so, you know, we want to see uh, the new measure introducing identity ver verification for all new and existing registered directors, company directors, those with significant control of companies, which can then um, be leveraged by FIs, not just, you know, unilaterally, but as a, you know, part of a pool of information that can be available to all FIs that are contributing to KYC processes uh, using uh, LEIs or legal entity identifiers at the at the corporate level. So that's something which, you know, obviously the GLIFE framework and, and the work that's going on around that would need to plug into this. There's obviously challenges in terms of legal and, and you know, data sharing, uh, but that's something which uh, if a 20-digit legal entity identifier could be added uh, for each company, that would be part of the solution. Um, and fourthly, recommending that government procurement services lead by example and mandate the use of LEIs for all government suppliers. So that's on the other side, on the on the government side. So we've got the, the corporate entities and then the government entities as the fourth recommendation uh, in the paper. Back to you, Chris. Great. So John, the hard question. <laughs> Why is it so difficult to shut fraudsters out of trade? It doesn't feel to me like the recommendations are rocket science. Why, why, why have we found it or why are we finding it so difficult? I think it's because we are currently on the cat and mouse game um, because fraudsters are heavily evolving in their strategies, in the ways in which they commit fraud. I think there's a lot of awareness. Um, each, of one, each and every one of us is aware about different kinds of fraud, even on a personal day-to-day -day basis. Just last week alone, I got a text message, oh, that's it just came in on my text message that I have not paid my, um, I have not paid my um, the ticket which I was given. It's overdue and I'm supposed to be charged the amount of money. I mean, I said, when did I cure this charge? And there was a link to click on it and to press that link and to go and pay the fee. I'm going to make this could be fraud. <laughs> this is actually could be fraud, you know. So I didn't continue that. So I actually blocked that. I was telling my colleague, he just came in on Tuesday, and I was talking to my colleague and said, this is what I just came to my 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 text message. And she told me this. She got something similar to that as well. So. I'm very sure that each one, each and every one of us, I'm bringing it close to home now. We, I think there's a lot of awareness in terms of fraud. It's so prevalent today, irrespective of where you are. You know, it's so common. Either you are, even if you're not browsing, you get a text message, you get a call from somebody who wants to defraud you. If you go online, I was shopping, I was on Facebook the other day. I got, I got to, oh, you could, you could shop and buy this. That's very good, decent price. Or the website was fake, you know. So every day we get encountered by such... <clears throat> So we, know, we are kind of inundated by such avenues to, to um, <clears throat> where fraud could be committed. So it's everly evolving. So we're kind of on a catch-up basis. So it's difficult to meet up um, <clears throat> because the technology that we that is being developed today is going more and more enhanced. Uh, we're talking about using AI and using machine learning to detect anomalies and algorithms. The same, the same fraudsters are using the same AI as well, using deep fakes, using more sophisticated phishing emails we've been taught in training oh if if an email doesn't address you doesn't come to your name maybe it's, it's most likely fraud but you have them coming these days and it's addressing to you in particular it's as if this person knows me you know it's it's getting more it's even as if it's more genuine so it's getting more and more sophisticated uh, sophisticated today so um there's also the human element as well uh in terms of um addressing fraud we're always prone to making errors because fraud has prior on um, uh, naivety, prize on our trust, prize on maybe greed as well, because they offer all different, very lovely, uh, something uh, lovely um, price, good deals, and we think it's a good idea. As I said, if it's good to be true, it just might not be true. So there's a lot out there. Um, we are currently playing catch up. There's, there's the challenges of resources, not having enough funds not have enough capital to deploy, to develop uh, um, our, our technology, so to speak, to meet up with what the frosters have. So we're currently playing a catch up. That's one of the key reasons why we're struggling today. Mm. And let's just kind of build on that. Um, why, why do you think from a government point of view, why does trade fraud seem to be a poor cousin to domestic fraud, which seems to get lots of attention, lots of initiatives. People are pretty aware of it. Governments are actively involved in it. But every time we talk about fraud in trade, suddenly it all goes very quiet, very quickly. Why, why is that? 
you'll find that whenever we talk about trade, everyone goes quiet because it is complex, right? It's, it's something we deal with as, as trade uh, professionals on a day-to-day -day basis. But just talking about the domestic fraud, where, where the focus has been, and UK Finance, I think, published a report last year saying 1.2 billion approximately was lost to fraud in that year. Um, and a lot of that fraud, the majority of that fraud was linked to um, payments, card payments, remote banking. So if you look up, if you think about the, um, the end victim there, they're usually the most vulnerable in society. It could be retail customers, it could be small and medium businesses, it could be vulnerable elderly people. So there is rampant fraud and, uh, and significant impact on the broader society, but it doesn't take away from the fact that trade finance fraud is relevant and important. It is a different beast to manage uh, because of, of course, it's cross-border trade. Um, it's not just about a fraudster going online and, you know, creating an authorized push payment. It's, it's just one part of trade continues to be very physical and paper-based. So, you know, the whole attempt around falsifying documents, falsifying bills of lading, invoices, et cetera, continues to be a problem. Uh, if you look at the open account trade, um, there we have large teams as banks, we have uh, large teams focused on, especially in the UK, in the receivables finance space, staying close to customers' businesses, staying close to any trends around fresh air invoicing, which continues to be a problem. So, so it is a complex topic. There is lots being done internally within organizations to address it. I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, you know, the, the government is not focused on it. I think we need to help drive the focus around trade finance because it is a complex topic and we need to take our expertise to the table as well. Okay, Todd, if I can bring, bring you in. Um, as we digitalize trade, obviously there's a massive amount of focus on trade digitalization, not just in trade finance, but more broadly. What, what opportunity do you think that presents in terms of uh, tackling the fraud issue? Sure, so I, I mean, there's a few different ways to look at it. Digitalizing trade has both economic growth opportunities attached to it, as well as basic um, cost savings associated with it just from the automation and uh, um, and the efficiencies that you've gained. Now, depending on the studies that you you read, I've seen numbers between five and ten billion dollars annually. Now, the it, it, if I couple this with the issue of fraud, though, I don't want this to get lost because this is true for both the private sector as well as the public sector. And I think you alluded to this when you talked about. Um, the, the cost just kind of being passed along. And so therefore it's not necessarily um, as prevalent or, or does, it may not pinch quite as hard, right? But the higher your fraud incidents are, the higher your mitigation costs are. And so from a technology development and investment point of view, you have less investment that's available for growth. Um, and, and for the things that can generate um, new ideas and new opportunities. So, so when we think about digitalizing trade, right, there's a, there's a handful of areas that we're seeing right now. Certainly um, improving the efficiency of manual controls offers huge cost reductions and, and the larger your operations are, the more your cost, your cost reductions are there. Another thing is around efficiency. So with the use of, of things like artificial intelligence, um, more quantitative analysis, you can then deploy your human capital to focus on assessment of risk, to focus on threat mitigation, and then actually executing the, the mitigation techniques to try to prevent fraud, to identify fraud and then to prevent fraud. Digitalization addresses one of the other um, topics that I think Jaya mentioned, which is, you know, if you have paper that's sitting in your desk, nobody else in the universe knows about it, right? And, and so once you digitalize, it allows for greater connectivity across stakeholders and therefore allows you to develop collaboration in your defense systems across the entire ecosystem. Now, there's, there's a few initiatives that I think many of you are probably familiar with in the market, but I go back to what is it that we're really trying to solve for, right? And one of them is 
are you who you actually purport to be or represent yourself to be? And we see that there's great opportunities in things like digital identity. There's been a lot of um, discussion around the growth of, of uh, uh, LEIs, for example, um, and and it's now up to, I think, 2.7, 2.8 legal entity identifiers that have been issued. But guess what? We need to get that number to somewhere around 50 million or, or 100 million. There's, there are definitely instances where, where banks have deployed um, digitalization to facilitate automated document checking. And so if you go back to uh, well, what are the issues? Are you who you say you are? The second one is, is this transaction what it actually purports to be? And by being able to automate some of that um, uh, documentation checks and so forth, you also can then reduce your risk there. And, and there was a, a mention around APIs. There are quite a few initiatives in the market now looking at connectivity, not just between banks, but across shipping, across customs, and across the financing chain. And, and you've got examples of this being done in, in some markets being supported by the public sector. Certainly, um, you know, Singapore jumps to mind and, and there are other jurisdictions that are starting to weigh in on this. So I think the opportunity economically is clear and I think with digitalization, we can then go back to address those three basic elements of, of what fraud is. Brilliant. Thank you. If I can go to the other Todd, we've got two Todds, two Todd Bs as well. So it's a bit confusing today. I'm aligned with Todd. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Todd with one D. <laughs> <laughs> um, why are we so focused on the foundational infrastructure? You know, why not take a different approach? Why, why have we homed in on... Yeah, what we would call an ICC market infrastructure. So I think you know I think one of the um, the areas that um, the financial industry could really benefit from is to be able to leverage, you know, as Todd mentioned, new technology solutions, but also how to use that technology, whether it's AI, whether it's some form of machine learning. You know, we're seeing solutions such as Quantexa and a few others, IBM already being used by banks to tackle fraud in the backdrop of the. Dear CEO letter a few years ago. So, you know, there's a lot of improvement now in terms of transaction monitoring, um, for example. Uh, but then, you know, the, the data insights that that need to, that we, we all need, uh, many of them are the same data insights. It might be for the same client, right? It might be for the same um, borrower. It might be at the same stage of origination um, at, the, at the transactional level, um, post-transaction monitoring, unusual or suspicious activity, reporting, procedural guidance, lessons learned. These are all different aspects of looking into fraud or fraud risks, whether they're crystallized, whether they're emerging, whether there's something that we could pick up uh, by sharing information between FIs. Uh, and so in order to, to, to lay out that infrastructure, I think it's important at a foundational level to bring together the parties. And I sort of mentioned that a little earlier as well, um, to, to sort of build um, sort of a sustainable fraud risk control uh, framework. Um, which would not only exclude bad actors from the system, but would also um, make the system uh, stronger and, and be able to uh, contribute information to the authorities, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's regulators, um, to sort of uh, make the um, a more robust, resilient system, which, and I think as Todd had mentioned earlier as well, I mean, you've got cybersecurity, you've got all kinds of threats that are coming out now. So whether it's using generative AI, which is a buzzword nowadays, to, to, to infiltrate a bank's um, broad risk control system. You know, yeah. we, we haven't seen any such incidents yet, but it may well be. And I see our LIBF colleagues in the back. We had a, a conversation around this at the session last year. Um, it may well be that, you know, we develop something as an industry. We lay the foundations, but then that foundation is then susceptible to a different type of risk. Um, so fraud risk will always be there, but in order to address the risk, as, a, as an industry within each country, obviously we will have challenges in terms of cross-border, whether it's data sharing, whether it's different understanding about, about privacy and secrecy, whether it's um, restrictions in certain markets uh, for certain types of uh, uh, things, such as data storage, right? Where can it be stored? Where can it be assessed, analyzed? Whether it's, you know, the Proceeds of Crimes Act, uh, which, which will restrict non-equivalent low-risk jurisdictions from obtaining 
information about UK SARS, right? Um, these are all things that need to be addressed. They're challenges, but not 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 uh, you know not things that cannot be addressed if we work together and lay that foundation. Uh, starting with the UK, which is a problem that we can solve, given that we're all here today, uh, with the UK banks here, and then partnering with with other uh, jurisdictions to to develop uh, broader uh, foundations. Yeah, just to build on that, John, um, this point around cooperation comes up over and over again, the need to work together. If you look at the UK market, a lot of the ingredients are here. So what are other countries doing? Singapore's been mentioned a couple of times. Are there other countries that are out there doing good work? And, and why is it that they're doing stuff and we're not? Is that because there's a lack of incentives here to bring us together to solve the problems? Um, I think the UK is in terms of advancement uh, in measures to put in place to prevent fraud. And the UK is actually t up there. Um, I think it matches its pairs. But as you say, there's always room for improvement. Um, you talked about Singapore. Singapore used to have loads of fraud cases, but uh, they put together like a central registry where they could manage some of those assets by the trade finance side. Um, China has something very similar as well. They have the credit uh, central registry. So having like a trade registry or a credit registry where some of the assets are stored, a uh, uh, kind of uh, warehouse such that uh, you could reconfirm some of those uh, deals that you currently have to avoid things like double discounting or, or invoice financing fraud. We don't have that at the moment in the UK. So we don't really have any check and balances if a client wants to ask for funding in 10 different banks. We don't have a way we could check each of them against each other. There's currently nothing in place. Unlike if we had like a central registry where we could monitor these, I think that will go a long way. That's what some countries have done today to prevent uh, some of these fraud cases, especially on the supply chain finance, supply chain finance side. There's definitely uh, um, incentives to um, more collaborative arrangement. You can see even with the changes uh, and the ECCTA uh, talks about the failure to prevent fraud. It's, an, it's a good initiative from from the government in terms of holding corporates and banks or large organizations more accountable and because it, it has to ensure that we put in measures in place to prevent fraud from happening in our organizations. Um, that was not really been in place. So such measures definitely help. Uh, it, it helps the, the corporates or the banks or the organization to sit up. Um, from experience, um, what I observe is companies or banks or FIs, wherever they might be, they don't really take it seriously until, until it becomes a regulatory issue. Until you're mandated to do certain things, that's when you take it seriously. So I see that putting this act together is, is something that will help corporates to, to begin to sit up, to put in measures to, to, uh, in place to prevent fraud. Things like trainings, um, um, trainings are, is very important. A lot of awareness, investment in technology, automating our processes. Some of us are working banks whereby process are very, very manual. And during audit processes, it's not picked up. You know, it's not mentioned about why your process is very manual because it's susceptible to fraud. To fraud, none is none of them is picked up during the audit process. So it has to form part and parcel of um, audits, external audits from regulators or from FCA, whatever body. Once we have that in place, UK begin to sit up and begin to match our pairs. Uh, companies like um, you think about Singapore, right? But the companies like the, in the Nordics, for instance, Sweden, maybe Finland, they have. Um, even Estonia have what they call um, digital identities for individuals, where you have stronger, your payments is linked to your identity itself. Everything is done automated online. It's linked to your, your personal identity. Um, China has something similar to that as well. Uh, they have what they call these, um, the Alipay. We also have the WeChat Pay as well. I was in China a few, about two, three months ago. You can't use a card. You can hardly use a card. Even if you still someone's card, you can hardly use it, you know, because everything is tied to WeChat Pay. It, it's so strong in grilled into the system. That's everything you do. You pay through, your, through the Alipay. You do everything through the WeChat Pay. So it's very, very difficult to break into that system. So we need to come into system whereby we are beginning to build certain framework outside of using card payment that can easily be stolen and your card can be replicated and you can commit fraud based on that. So then we have to move away from that and begin to look at having digital identity sort of payments, which is which has a very strong AI built into it or more, uh, which is safer, so to speak, to use. 
Just picking up on those, Todd, if I can bring you and Jaya into the conversation, um, you know, what seems pretty clear is those countries that are being named, you have quite active governments and regulators. Um, how can we work better with the government and the regulators here in the UK in order to solve some of these problems? Uh, Jaya, yeah, so maybe if you go first and then Todd. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. yeah look, I think um, absolutely there are great examples of governments pushing the agenda. The invoice registry is definitely being those. I think from a UK perspective, I learned the acronym is ECTA. So ECCTA, I think, was laid a great foundation. I think one of, you know, you really explained that really clearly, John. I think what I also like about that is the senior manager accountability, that it places accountability at the senior levels for liability of you know, any fraud that ultimately ends up benefiting the company because of an employee, maybe or an associated party. So the foundational elements are there. Um, and the government is actually listening. So we do have a government that's open to listen. I mentioned some of the early wins with the, the capital treatment, uh, wherein the government have helped us land an, a positive outcome for the UK. Similarly, they're, they're willing to listen and cooperate with us. I think what we do need is the improvement is around We've obviously talked a lot of about ideas here. We need to sit at the table. We need to have the right parties at the table to help solutionize through whether it's a sandbox environment, innovative environments to test what is it that can be shared. We have all the technology, API, we have data available. We still do need to go through the whole digitalization journey with trade because we need data available in structured forms to be able to share it across organizations. Otherwise, we're, we're still in the world of trying to develop OCR technology, which isn't as effective as structured data would be. So there's steps that the industry need to take and demonstrate progress to the government. And therefore, in parallel, we need to have dialogue with the government, with regulators to talk about the ideas that could lead to this information sharing. I think the approaches of the governments are slightly different as well. I think, mm -hmm. you know, mandating certain approaches may not be the best approach in the UK. It's about um, highlighting the business case, highlighting the economic cost of, of fraud risk and highlighting those two different parties in the language that is relevant to the party. So if it's a CFO in, an, in a corporate organization, why do they need to invest in change? If it's the government, why do they need to invest in change? If it's change that banks need to lead, why do we need to you know, invest? So articulating the business case to have the right investment, to drive the right dialogues, I think that is where we need to have better momentum and, and change as, as you know, a collective. And I'm hopeful as a task force, we can drive that. Sounds good. What are your thoughts, Todd? Yeah, so a, a couple of other um, examples, and we are observing a pilot right now that involves the UK um, and another country. It's it's being led by uh, HM Customs, and and the customs organization from another country is primarily focused around trade based money laundering as opposed to um, invoice fraud in the way that we discussed it. But I think the key there is that there is a coordinated effort between the parties that have access to the important data that can identify uh, uh, the, the issues. Because the banks only have access to a limited set of data, right? So unless you connect those that have access to the shipping data, to the underlying parties data, and to the transaction data, and then the financial flows, you're going to be missing a piece of the puzzle. So, so we're super excited to actually see, and, and it was a similar pilot that was done in Asia. We're super excited to finally see some collaboration across the financial side of the spectrum, as well as the, the shipping and freight side of the spectrum, as well as the government entities who have access to that data. Now, a second thing, and this is a little bit of my, my soapbox, so forgive me. Um, but from a regulatory uh, perspective, there has to be better alignment of the use of resources to address this issue of identity and, and know your customer. So I'll give you a, a sort of layman's example, right? If, if, any, if anyone wants to obtain a driver's license, you, or at least I, and forgive me because I'm going to give you a U.S. example, but I'm hoping that it applies in, in the U.K., you go into a designated office that can give you a license. You have to present proof that you are who you say you are, whatever that may be, a birth certificate or whatever. You then have to take a form of a, a test that you understand what the rules of, of the road are and how they need to be applied, and you have to pass that test. 
And then you actually have to demonstrate that you are capable of operating a vehicle safely. Assuming you can do all of those things, you're then given a, a license to drive. Now, imagine if every time you wanted to go to rent a car or to buy a car, each of those individual rental car offices had to put you through the same tests, right? The weight of that process would collapse on itself. It doesn't work that way. So there is some measure of being able to say, we're gonna validate who someone is once, and then we're gonna allow them to use that identity to, it, to, to ensure to other parties with that they're transacting with that they are who they say they are, right? We're gonna use the, the, the right to access certain systems for you to be able to use that across multiple providers in the system. Because we don't do that when it comes to banking, it means that the industry spends an enormous amount of resources and energy to do duplicative processes and it creates for loopholes, right? So I think if, if, if we want to address the issue of fraud, we ought to similarly think about having somewhat of a golden source approach to identity and who should have access to certain types of capabilities. That's a huge departure from how regulations are, are set up today. And another thing that I think is emerging, uh, which we're starting to look at now, is the use of artificial intelligence as a detection tool and what the rules of the road are for how that can be used, how it can be deployed, and what institutions can actually rely on. I think we have to make sure we get consistency from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as to how some of these technology tools can be used. Great. So let's take a pause there. Um, we've got a few minutes left in the sessions. Anybody have any questions for the for the panel? Got one here. I think we've got some mics. Okay, one there and one at the back as well. Okay. Um, so a question for, for the banks. Um, you know, I fully agree with what a number of you said about the importance of KYC and the LEI approach. I'm just wondering what's stopping the banks from actually going out to their customer base and saying, we expect you to implement life in the next two years, otherwise we stop processing your business. Why don't you just drive it through yourselves? Well, what's the challenges in trying to do something like that? Yeah. So what stops us from asking customers to go adopt the LEI? I think with, with any such initiative, right, we need to be clear about what the benefits are coming out of that. And with the LEI, we need to be able to demonstrate as a bank that it has all of the the the, the the data that we need to connect to our KYC systems, to connect to everything we need internally from a risk mitigation perspective. So until that wide case is established, which is what we're trying to do through the task force and our recommendations and working with the government, I think it is it is a good to have right now. Um, but there are internal priorities as well around fin fighting financial crime and mitigating the risk of fraud. So it's about, it's a question of prioritizing, but we need to prioritize it in the right context. And in the context of having, you know, systemic um, infrastructure in place that talks to each other. So connecting the LEI to authentic data sources that can be used for, you know, centralizing potentially KYC in the future to potentially having a, a fraud system that works and alerts each other. That, that use case has to be built a little further before we can go mandate all of our clients to, to have an LEI. Anything to add, John? Yeah, you could tell clients to... Uh, Register with LEI to the global LEI, but whether they're going to do it is another thing entirely. Um, that's why um, I like the whole idea of pushing, uh, working with the, with the government as well, um, making recommendations. So I think if it forms part and parcel of recommendation with the government, filters to the bank as well, I won't say mandates, maybe it may have the right word, but getting them, gingering them to basically talk to corporates as it becomes part and parcel of the KYC CDD process. It, it becomes a bit more effective. If it's like just just race with LEI, they will never join. But if it's part and parcel of the process and it's part of CDD, KYC, it becomes a lot more effective that way. Hmm. Todd, do, do you want yeah, to... and I, I would I would agree. I think that you know, as far as business restrictions or exiting client relationships go, banks have to be very careful. Um, there has to be a legal basis to do that. Um, you know, we see that all the time in the sanctions space or 
you know, money laundering space or, you know, if it's something to do with conduct, client conduct, you know, there has to be a legal basis to exit a relationship. Um, and John's absolutely right. You know, there has to be a national, and I think Jay also mentioned it, it's, there needs to be a national agenda, but this sort of comes through from, from government, from parliament. I mean, we talked about digital ID. I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but North Korea has a very successful digital ID program. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the day, we need what works for the UK. Um, we should have put that as recommendation five. <laughs> yeah. um, would you, before we just get to that, I think I'll just jump in a little one, because I think there are two challenges with LEIs. Uh, the first challenge we're trying to solve is issuance. You know, there just aren't enough. 4% of companies and trading companies in the UK have an LEI. So that's clearly not going to solve the problem. We need that to be 100%. So how do we get to 100%? That's where companies' house comes in. That's the simplest way. We've looked at every option. The simplest way of doing that is if they just issue the 11-digit number and everybody would have an LEI overnight. However, you've got the second challenge, which is adoption. So we know listed companies have LEIs, but we also know they're not using them. So I think, you know, let's, let's one at a time, let's get the issuance problem solved. Because I think we know much more today than we did two or three years ago when we started this journey with government. And then we can start to work on the education issues. How do you get the best out of an LEI across your global supply chain? Because I think with that comes the business case as well. Sorry, we had a, a question at the back. Hi, it's uh, Lorna Strong. Just wanted to address the idea of the centralized database. And um, obviously that would help fraud and certainly double uh, financing and this, this sort of thing. Um, not unlike what we are subject to as individuals, as sort of a credit reporting bureau, right? That people can look or banks can look that are authorized and see what, what you've borrowed and when and when you've paid back. The issue is that um, there's... There's corporates are not too keen on this. So in Singapore, for example, after the Hinlong trading fraud, um, there were a number of recommendations made um, in a in a uh, corporate government bank uh, consortium, and that was one of the big ones, a centralized database. But it was dropped because the corporates basically refused to participate. Um, the other recommendations were required, but not that. If you look at places like China, they have a bit more ability um, to enforce that. And I think in India, they've done it to make it a condition of financing the government and again have had sort of more power. It's a little bit more difficult because um, corporates in terms of banking and someone asked a question, why can't banks do this or that? The large corporates don't want it because they want some um, lack of transparency, should we say. They don't want all of their counterparts to know exactly what they're doing all the time. Not because they're doing something nefarious. They just want the confidentiality about their financing, I think. So I think that's a challenge when we think about the centralized database. And maybe there could be a, a double layer so that the corporates don't have to expose their whole portfolio to all the banks or something like that. We should mention that on the task force is a, a, a whole network of representatives from industry. You've got the Association of Corporate Treasurers, British Chambers of Commerce, Federation of Small Business, uh, as, as well as ourselves as ICC, and specifically because we know we can't solve this. And you've got some corporates actually in the task force individually, because <laughs> we know we can't solve this without corporate help. This is not going to come. We know that approach doesn't work. It's been tried, uh, you know, by mandating it to listed companies and banks, and it just hasn't translated to the change we want to see. Hence, we now need to move to the next stage and say, right, what more do we need? Has anyone else got any questions? We have a microphone. It's not so much a question, actually. It's just alluding to what the gentleman earlier said. I think the KYCC aspect is very important because for a bank, you have a choice of who you want to deal with. And I think going further than the Wolfsburg question is, I think one has to really look at the customer's customer, if you like, the FI's customer. So if you understand the trading patterns, who they trade with, um, you can design AI technology in place to detect any divergence from the norm. I think that's an area I think AI could really um, delve into. But on a wider scale, when we're looking at um, AI, using AI to develop technology or to detect fraud, I know there's been a lot of work being put in place, I think by you, Chris, as well, um, how to address the issue of fraud by going away from paper documents, like docking the title, how we can use uh, artificial intelligence, or if you like, um, digitaliz digitalization in documents to prevent fraud at source. Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, well, uh, open to views. Does anybody want to answer that? I've, so I certainly just, have a view yeah, I think, too, but... Thank you for raising that. So I think um, 
in terms of the Wolfsburg CBDDQ, I mean, there are certain questions that could be included in that questionnaire from a trade finance perspective. So that's something that you know, some of us are working with BAFT on to try and get that um, list of questions, which we're you know into Wolfsburg, et cetera. So I think that's that's a great point because you know, the questionnaire tends to address payments, not not necessarily trade finance risk that's arising from the FI client's client, who is the you know the applicant, for example, of an LC. Um, but I think uh, to draw the point is that that you know that, that was made earlier as well, uh, in terms of trade finance and you know legitimate reasons for why a seller would want to mask their identity from the buyer, and we're seeing you know switch BLs, for example, right, where you're getting you're getting IMB alerts in your trade transaction monitoring because you're not able to find the actual seller of the goods because the, the, the BL has been switched by an agent, for example, in Dubai. And then, you know, the buyer doesn't know, you know, whom to buy it from directly. So that's a pure commercial play. But I think what that does also highlight is that when we talk about, you know, the Electronic Documents, um, uh, Trade Documents Act from last year, uh, that, you know, e-trade docs such as BLs would also need to be supplemented with rails for uh, these e-title docs to move across uh, platforms and cross borders. So back to your, your point about AI, um, that data that we need, for example, digital electronic bills of lading, you've got these digital islands that are forming in terms of bilateral um, transactions, but not transactions where anyone can sort of log in and, and sort of check the, you know, the, the validity of a digital uh, BL based on an ID that's common and unique to all versions of it that were issued, um, or, you know, that were issued to various people or that various parties are presenting to banks in documentation. John, John, Todd, do any of you want to yeah, I could add something to that. Yes, I'd, I'm a firm believer mm -hmm. in CDD KYC process. I think if you address that at the, at the onboarding stage, I think you have solved fifty percent <coughs> of the fraud cases that will come into the into the into your organization. And having an annual by annual review of CDDs, I think goes a long way to curb fraud. And the next is on the transactional space. So day to day transactions you get in, we have to put in certain measures in place, double checking. In just so you have middle offices team, which you are in one of those teams anyway, helping check some of transaction flows that come through to detect any anomalies that comes in. Account numbers could change, so things could change. You do all the checks on the transaction side. I think it goes a long way to also crop for significantly. But yes, to your point, AI will also be very, very, it's very good to, to have, but at the same time, it's quite expensive. So a lot of time people look at the cost implication to in involve AI into that process. It's quite expensive. Some just sometimes some don't even want to do it. Um, so that's one thing also, also, also to, to, to bear in mind. Just, just a very brief point to add on that. I think AI is also developing technology and it's, it takes a while to prove it out. So it's about, you know, having the patience to see that investment pay out the returns. I think that that is the difficult nut to crack with using AI to solve for such problems wherein you have immediate risk and you need to make sure that the technology works day one. So there's, there's a bit of a lead time to get there. Just one other point I wanted to address. Um, the central registry is an interesting concept, and I get that, uh, you know, that some governments are able to influence it better. But the focus of the, the recommendations is not just the central registry acknowledging that. So we did discuss as a, as a challenge. The focus is a broader set of recommendations. And then within that context, we can have a look at the central registry as an idea. Right. Todd, do you want to chip in on that question? So just, I, I think one other thing I'd, I'd highlight, um, we worked with the Asian Development Bank on an initiative that they led to try to standardize suspicious transaction reporting. And I know that they've worked with some uh, FIUs in, in a variety of countries, particularly across Asia, because I think the, the better we can get uh, intel around how these suspicious transactions manifest, then we can better tailor solutions to them. What happens typically today is that every bank will have their own uh, methodology for how they document and submit suspicious transaction reports. So it makes it much more difficult to really deploy um, aggregate industry-wide solutions against those because the data just isn't there to focus on it. Uh, just a, a final note before we say thank you to the panel. Um, all I would chip in, sorry, we've got another, one more question. Uh, all I would do is chip in on that. You'll see this is the first of a series of papers coming from the task force. The next one will be a roadmap for digitizing UK trade. And then there'll be a paper on KYC, which we're just beginning to 
map out. Uh, and what you're going to see from all of this is a constant reinforcement of some of this foundational stuff. Uh, and that's quite purposeful because the point we're making, especially to government and the regulators, is we can solve some of these issues, but not without government and the regulators working alongside us. Uh, you know, and we've got to keep ramming that point home, looking at the system from different perspectives, fraud one minute, KYC the next, then trying to be quicker, cheaper, faster uh, on trade. Um, because I think we're, we're not being consistent in the language to government. Uh, all the regulators necessarily, they're not getting the message. And so I think we have to keep saying the message over and over again uh, to the point where it's just not going away and then obviously we can actually get on with the job. But I think that's an important, important aspect for all of us to take away from this whole exercise. Sorry, there was another, another question and then I'll wrap up. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> so my question first is uh, that uh, in the context of Ukraine war, there is a lot of sanction has been introduced. So how much they were effective in practical sense? Because we read a lot of legislation and in terms of implementation, what problems do you have practically face in the banking sector? And my second question is from John. So John, you will see that BRICS has developed some kind of alternative payment system. How could that affect the transactions and for prevention measures which are introduced in the ICCs at any other forums. Thank you very much. Maybe John, if we go first and then we'll come to the technology. You have to rephrase that question. <laughs> Let me get it right. Can you rephrase it again? Let me get it right. It's a mix. Bricks. Bricks. Uh... Okay, okay, so okay. I was talking about the bricks. Yeah. So the bricks has introduced alternative payment system. Mm -hmm. So how this affects all these measures being introduced in ICC at other forums regarding the fraud preventions and uh, digitalization of trade and what is their effect on that? Um, I'm not sure I yeah. need to get that question, but I'm not familiar with the BRICS alternative payment system. So if anyone knows that, I think I have a stab at it. I think uh, the fact that it's not as established as prevalent as such as as, as of today, that we as banks have even acknowledged that, that that is a challenge. I think it's an emerging challenge for sure. Um, the BRICS, I understand, are talking about having a separate reserve currency and a potential payment system. Uh, again, it's an emerging trend that we'll need to watch and monitor. I don't think any of us have a ready answer to how we will tackle any specific fraud trends emerging from that. That's, that's a wait and watch space, I would say. Yeah, and I think uh, if I can chime in, I think we just take this as the last question because we've got to kind of wrap up and move on. But you know, the point with BRICS is BRICS, the GDP of BRICS is bigger than G7, and it's getting bigger. Uh, you know, we're, m we're moving to a multimodal world, is the truth of it. The world order is changing. Uh, that's exactly why ICC is doing a lot of the work it's doing, and that's exactly why a lot of the fragmentation and frictions and tensions exist in the system. So I, I think we have to accept uh, it's why we're going to have two tax systems, because now, you know, the BRICS plus a whole bunch of other countries have launched off on a UN global tax treaty. There will be more and more of this type of activity coming. I think we have to accept that. The, the challenge for all of us in the industry within ICC globally is to try and make sure that whatever's happening is aligned as much as it possibly can be uh, and being done for the right reasons, for the right outcomes, because it's going to be painful and it's going to be costly the more the systems are in place. But what we can't change is changing uh, demographics, economics, uh, and politics uh, going on in the world. That's not going to change. Uh, so, but it's reality, right? So it's quite, it's quite if he's if it's a fly on the wall, I think it's quite interesting as a business. This is really painful. Uh, we had a, a presentation actually at the last task force meeting, mapping out the sort of domains globally, and it was it was it was a nightmare from a business supply chain point of view. Uh, but that's what's coming, you know, lots of different barriers everywhere. So um, we've got to be engaged. That's why we keep saying we must be engaged. We must be at the table. We must be represented in every single forum. Uh, otherwise, this, this will be worse than what it could be. So can I just say a huge thank you to Todd and, and our panelists. Um, I hope you found that useful. Uh, please do talk about the report. You should all have links to the report. I, I've been told I think there's a typo in the back, so I will correct that. So that's my fault. Um, 
But either way, please do use it because I, I hope it's a, it's a discussion point and it's only as good as what we use it and promote it, talk to stakeholders, companies, clients, government. I think it's really, really important. We do have an opportunity, I think, is the takeaway. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Mike now, who's going to give you the chance to uh, feedback with some questions uh, on Slido. We're keen to hear what you, your views are around this kind of topic areas. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for a great panel as well. I think that was fantastic stuff. Um, really insightful, not just on the topic, but also on what's being done to, to sort it out. Um, just switching the focus a little bit now. It's nice to um, hear from the panel and what they had to say. Uh, it'd be great to hear what you've got to say. <laughs> so what we've done here at the moment is just set this uh, little Slido session up. And it's a very short session, but it's basically to get the feedback from everybody in this room about what your thoughts are on this topic. Uh, you've seen the paper, you've heard about it being discussed in various forums as well around the place. But if I could encourage you, just as we're introducing it here, to either take a picture of the QR code there, and that will upload it, or if you go to Slido and then input that um, the code itself, you'll be able to, you can see at the bottom left there. Uh, and we're going to put up a few questions. And the idea is to get some feedback from you. Uh, it's quite a diverse industry group here, which is nice, but it's also then to inform a little bit. Um, the discussions that we're having going forward, not just within ourselves and rooms like this, but also with the government and to understand where to position and how to prioritize things. But it's more of a temperature check, really, to get people's idea of an honest idea of, uh, of their thoughts on certain parts of the subject. So I'll just give people a chance to upload that a little bit. And that is going to help out. So we've got a first question up there. Um, the good thing is, as well, uh, this is anonymous. Um, talked about during earlier on the panel that uh, one of the questions is a bit sensitive subject fraud. So people talk about it, but they don't like to talk about it too much in public. So this is actually a good opportunity for people just to give your feedback in terms of what you think about it without discussing who you are or which organization you come from. So this should be a good independent sort of neutral check on, on where we are. So if you can see the question, anybody having trouble signing in? Hopefully people can get in there. It looks like the, the results are coming in. So the first question is really about awareness um, and general awareness and consistency of awareness about how well fraud is understood in the market. Um, we've got neck and neck on the first two here, quite well understood and not very well understood. So still lots to be addressed. So half and half. Um, I think if we probably had this question a few years ago, we'd probably even more spread down to the bottom. So at least it's some good progress there as well. But nice to see that um, there is a, 101. Fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how the algorithms work, and we'll have a look later on, basically. Talk to the Slido guys. Yeah, thanks very much for that, <laughs> James. Um, so 50-50. So basically, quite well understood, just a few areas to address, and we don't need to go into detail here, um, but also not very well understood, still lots to be addressed. So I think this, this points to one of the questions, which is about the, the commonality of understanding of fraud within the market. So there's still a bit of work to be done there. You know, that's good for the ICC to take on board. It's good for the, um, the partnerships that we're doing with government to take on board as well to really get to the bottom of it. Because I would suggest within this room, this is quite a well-informed group. And I think Chris mentioned the point, once you go to government and try and get the message to land, if that is sort of 50% of the understanding that's in this room, there's a bit of a problem. So it's to understand sort of which areas are, are more prevalent than others. Okay, what about your own companies now? And as I said before, um, this is anonymous, so don't worry. Just answer it honestly. How well do you think it's understood within your organizations? So what have we got? Basically, a half, 27%, 17% completely understood. So just a few areas to address. Actually, a bit mi mixed bag there as well, I'd say. Anybody want to make a comment on that? Uh, not well understood at all. I'm glad that's 2%. <laughs> that must be about one person. We can have a separate chat, if you like, later on. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's an evolving understanding, I think, in the organizations that we've worked for. I've worked 30 years in banking, and um, it's quite a broad subject, as was mentioned before as well. So the KYC part of it, the transactional side of it, the country side of it, et cetera, is, is quite tricky. But that's interesting as well. So we're going to capture some of these later on. We've got 45 votes up there as well. That's most of the room. But um, if anybody hasn't voted, I'll give you a second there, and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Natalie?
How big a risk is it? There's lots of risks in business, especially when we're doing international trade. You've got country risk, sovereign risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, etc. Where does fraud stack up there, basically? Um, a few seconds just to go on. Well, that's good. I think most people are coming in saying it's either very high risk or relatively high risk. So if we've got 80% of it saying it's at least very high risk, that's a good conversation started with the, with the colleagues at government as well to get them and their attention, basically, because it's not just something which might happen and it's immaterial. It's something which is on people's minds and not fully understood. So there's a good message there for us all. Uh, okay, next one, please. This is the second last one. Technology. So we talked about how well understood it is or isn't. Um, there's quite a few, we're all talking about AI and billions that have been poured into AI, but in terms of technology addressing fraud risk, um, how are we doing? Very well addressed, most of them addressed completely, or at the top, few basically. So for those that may not be able to see there, we've got basically two thirds saying it's not addressed at all. So there's a great opportunity for the, uh, the vendors out there to uh, target their market. Yeah, that's interesting. So basically we're in the top half. So most are one third, and I'd say better part of two thirds is a uh, uh, few of the risks only. Okay, and then a final one. This is this is less guided, but more an open-ended question. Um, oh, sorry, this is the penultimate one, sorry. Uh, Chris talks about regulators before and the roles of various regulators in different markets. Quick yes or no answer. Do you think they could do more? And I'm taking it there's no regulators in the mark in the room here, basically. Yeah. Okay. So that's clear. So, okay, that's very very clear. Uh, and the final question, again, open ended, and don't think about it too much. But your gut reaction, what comes out first when you think about the uh, the comment on trade? One word. What do you think is the most important thing which would help the industry manage it? Difficult to keep quiet here, but if you put it up, then you'll start see what questions and what what answers are actually popping up more frequently. Collaborations up there, regulators there. Oh, collaborations here again. And you can vote on what's been there already, I think. Digitization, data we're seeing. Tech. Well, there's only one winner on this one at the moment, but think. So that's a good justification of what the ICC are doing, Chris. <laughs> but we need more. Yeah. That's most of the people voted there. I don't think much is going to change radically. Collaboration, digitization, awareness is there. Plus the technology side, as we mentioned before, that's a pretty clear message. Okay, I think most people have had the chance to vote there who've got access to it. That's great. Okay, well, hopefully that's uh, that's informative to you as well. So it's always good to think about what other people are thinking in the market. Um, we'll take that on board as well in the ICC in our conversations uh, and the future work that we're doing. And there's another meeting next week as well, so we can we can feed that back in. But thanks very much for that. Hopefully it's uh, useful to you. Um, Moving forward, we're just going to go to the next part of this uh, presentation now. And I've got here Dylan Mosley. If you can ask Dylan to come up from our host, KNL Gates. Um, and it's a short session, really, because we, we all talk about uh, what's happening on the, industrial, on the industry side. But we're going to di uh, dive a little bit deeper into a couple of the case studies, basically. Um, and also have somebody who's from a, uh, an independent part of the market, if you want. So from a legal framework. Uh, or a legal representation, and get some honest views on specific cases which have been out there, what problems have been seen, any recurring issues, and then what that might mean for us going forward. So, um, Dylan, thanks very much for joining in. I'll come down and take a seat here, and we can kick yeah. off. First thing first, Dylan, any surprises? Any comments on what you saw up there? No. Um... I thought it was interesting that the two sort of words that jumped out to me from the slides, particularly the one at the end, um, was collaboration and technology. Um, you know, technology is interesting as a detection tool, but the question really for me is what you do when you do detect it. And I think that's where the collaboration comes in. I mean, when we discuss some of the case studies, I think the one thing that jumped out to me was that knowledge of some of the issues, I think, was very much within the grasp of some of the trade finance banks involved. But there was a sort of cultural and relationship issue as to what people did with the information in order to do something about it, rather than feeling embarrassed about it or hoping that things would come good. So it, it does require technology on its own and AI on its own. It's not going to solve the problem. There's got to be a cultural issue and a will to do something with the information which requires the collaboration. 
Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, so I should have introduced you a little bit more, and I'll let you introduce <laughs> yourself, but Dylan's one of the most respected minds, I think, here um, on financial and white-collar crime in the UK industry, a wealth of experience and, uh, and understanding of the subject. Why don't you give yourself a, a bit of an introduction, Dylan, then we'll move on to some of the questions. That well, that's very about. kind, Mike. I'm not sure I can put it that high, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I was a criminal barrister for 10 years, um, working um, in chambers, doing lots of trials, principally in the fraud money laundering space. Um, and I did that for 10 years until I came over to KNR Gates um, in 2013. So I've been here for 11 years and I head up the white collar crime team here. So it's anti-bribery and corruption, anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, sanctions, cross-border investigations, um, that sort of thing. I have had the dubious honour of, of doing a large scale trade finance fraud for the last five years. I think the case started for us in 2019. The underlying conduct goes back to 2012 um, and we're just coming to the end of it um, now um, and so it does give you an idea of how long some of these issues last you know it's lasted over a decade and we still haven't quite got to a resolution yeah fascinating um one of the questions we had up there dylan was about um fraud and how well understood it is um from your perspective from a legal perspective what different types of fraud can you see taking place in with international trade specifically um, if you just take us through some of those, and we touched on them in the panel, but from your perspective. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, the panel, I think, highlighted and, and summarised the key issues very well. I mean, you know, you can put different headings on it, whether it's a fraud by misrepresentation, theft, false accounting, sanctions violations, money laundering violations, you know, conspiracies to defraud if people are acting together in concert. But but they are sort of headings that, that often relate to to similar conduct, it's just a question of which offence is charged. Um, and, you know, you, you then move into what commodities you're dealing with. Are there particular problems in the steel industry or, or you know, in payments industries or in service industries? And they normally centre around particular economic or political pressures that are happening within those industries. And then, you know, you look at some of the common issues that come up. And I think, again, the panel mentioned it over and over again particularly in trade finance, you know, you see it very much in, in paper, you know, you see it in invoices, you see it in duplicate or, or double pledging of trades, you know, you, you see it in false bills of lading. And so, you know, the thing is a cycle, it repeats itself over and over and over, it seems, um, even going back to one of the speaker's points on, on Roman times, you know, very little changes in terms of the concept of it. It's just, it, you know, it, it may be in, within a different commodity or within a different industry within a different time okay. Okay. Uh, we're all aware of a lot of the cases i think some were mentioned before as well there's a lot of international cases of fraud obviously with a, a different leg and an extra leg in there there's domestic cases i think we talked about um the uh, in Lyon one before there are domestic cases arena tv carillion different types green cell even you could put into that you've got one that you want to dig into a little bit more and highlight some of the areas where the failings were there but some of the learnings ideally that we might be able to pick up from one of those cases why don't you take us through that and, uh, and let's have your thoughts on it yeah absolutely i mean before coming to that i mean you mentioned a couple of the sort of international cases there you know Quindao and, and zenrock you know on a on an international context i mean again what you're dealing with there is you know sort of warehousing where you've got sort of false documents in play or where you've got a complex oil and gas chain where the number of parties involved where there is double pledging within the chain. I mean, the similarities, you know, not only exist in the in the in in the international arena, but they also exist in the domestic arena. Because, again, in one of the examples you use there in the domestic arena, you know, you have with Arena TV, you've got again double pledging of resources in order to for, for a television company or a film company. Whereas, you know, you end up in a sort of almost Ponzi scheme environment because you're just double pledging of the resource to a number of different lenders. And it, it, I suppose it's no different uh, to the sort of case that, that I was going to talk about. I think that the one thing that I would sort of say at the outset of this sort of case study is that we, we are dealing in this context with what was a legitimate and very su successful steel trading business. And so it, it's not a question of it being fraud from inception or fraud from outset. It's something that became a fraud in, in the course of difficult trading. And so, you know, you can have very good KYC or due diligence or enhanced due diligence at the outset. But it's really the monitoring that you do, which is the most important because things change within a relationship. Um, it, you know, in the particular case that we were dealing with, it was a very, very successful uh, steel trading house that had traded for, I think, a decade before it hit trouble. And in 2011, it, it, it posted record profits. 
but things very quickly went wrong in 2012. And it was a mixture of things, really. Volatility of steel prices in the steel industry, um, loss of liquidity, a number of challenger banks pulled out because they were going through difficult times. Um, there were geographical problems, you know, which are inherent in sort of steel shipping, you know, late delivery, demerge charges, um, disputes with ports. And it really sort of spiraled and encouraged then, you know, sort of challenging behaviours within the steel trading business. But, you know, things started to happen during the course of 2012, um, in particular with cash pooling. So not liquidating particular steel transactions in order to pay particular letters of credit. And so what the business started to do was to sort of almost warehouse money and then pay the oldest debt. And then that morphed from cash pooling to <laughs> paper transactions where, you know, they weren't for additional steel trades, but more to sort of revolve the tenor of all loans to give more time to pay the debt because a good relationship had built up with this business for 10 years. And so the expectation was it would be paid back in due course. Let's not ruin a good relationship. Let's give the business time to, to pay the monies. But then paper transactions then, you know, sort of evolved into no steel deals where there was no steel at all, where, you know, sort of documents were created to say that there were deals. And so that led into then fraudulent documents and fraudulent bills of lading and fraudulent invoices. And then it finally you know, sort of culminates with double pledging where there is steel, but we say, I'll sell it to you, I'll sell it to you, I'll sell it to you. Well, you can only sell it once. Um, but, you know, that didn't morph from something that was fraudulent from inception. It, it, it morphed from something which was a very strong steel <laughs> trading business until three prongs of economic pressure hit it. And the most interesting thing, I think, in that whole case was that there were five trade finance banks involved who in total lost over $350 million. I mean, a huge, huge loss. But they couldn't, none of those banks could say with their hands on their hearts that they were not aware of these issues. The transaction monitoring reports, the audit reports, um, you know, the transaction risk reports, particularly with one of the trade finance banks, you know, were, were, were highlighting month on month, these issues are alive, you know, and it was well known. One of the banks, in fact, reported, we've had a historical problem with this business allowing cash pool. Sometimes they're late, but because we've got a good relationship with them, we allow them to pay from the pool rather than from the specific deal that we're trying to liquidate to pay the collateral off. And so, you know, it was a big warning sign of, you know, you've got to steady this relationship. The beam has gone from center and, you know, need, need to bring some honesty and discipline and hygiene back to the transactions so that people can't sort of step out and vary the terms of these agreements. But again, through perhaps embarrassment or, you know, sort of a relationship that had built up over years or, you know, we will be paid in the end, there wasn't that culture of we can put our hands up and cause a problem because I'll be perceived as a troublemaker or somebody, you know, ruining a good relationship that's there. And so it culminated in five different people experiencing the same problems and not collaborating and talking about it and all ending up in the same position at the end, of it, which is why I think it's interesting. You know, the technology, which everybody thinks is, is the sort of quick win, wouldn't have enhanced the knowledge of any of those banks. It was just a question of what they did with the information. Um, so, I mean, that we, I mean, we were still going through the process with it. Um, I mean, in terms of wider issues that came out of it, I mean, there were probably warnings in the statutory audits as well. Um, you know, they, they were available. They warned that, you know, there was a weakness of diversity of interest in this business and that there was a loss of liquidity would cause a big problem. That's precisely what happened. And I think that had some of this monitoring and had some of this, you know, put my hands up, happened at an early stage and more difficult conversations been had with that steel trading business, then it probably would have resulted in restructuring at an early stage. And it probably would have resulted in, um, the business getting into a smaller hole in terms of the debt that was owed and liquidating assets at a quicker rate and probably the losses would have been you know a lot less um had there been that culture of speak up first and so you're saying from the customer's point of view even if you were to have very diligent kyc procedures they were there they were there at a certain point in time but they weren't dynamic enough to reflect the changes in the environment absolutely which put the customer under energy pressure yeah. effectively I mean, so you, you could talk about, well, you know, given some of the jurisdictions involved, Singapore, China, you know, in terms of looking at stock, there would have been a harder sort of physical geographical audit to do. But on the financing, the, you know, the warning signs, the red flags were there. People were late for their payment month on month after month after month, and they were not operating within the, the terms of the letters of credit. 
And so no additional KYC or CDD or e EDD would have added to that picture. It would have been, you know, we've got it in, in the transaction risk reports. What do we do with this information? Acting on it. And you mentioned the banks involved all had similar issues. Is that so they were all aware, you think, of the situation at that point in time of the client and the business? Apart from the last bank um, that was persuaded to increase, um, you know, to provide facilities, I think probably towards the end of 2012, when the problem was so deep. And I think it, it probably is fair to say that that bank probably didn't conduct as deep a CDD and EDD and KYC as it should have done to understand why they were, they were being asked for these facilities at that time. But for the other four, definitely. Okay. Interesting as well. Okay, um, just moving on and, and in, relation, in, in relation to that. So from a, a wider perspective, and we talked about it before the EC, um, EC and CTA. Um, ECTA. The, ECTA, yeah. <laughs> well, well done. Well done. Well done. Well, picked it up. The ECTA, we can call it from now on. Um, this came in place at the end of last year. Is that a game changer in this space? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, failing to prevent offences are, are the fashion. Um, we, we started with the Bribery Act um, and then we brought it into Tax Evasion with the Criminal Finances Act. And what it does is, is it flips the responsibility back onto the company to say, well, if something has happened, what have you got in place to show that you've got adequate procedures or uh, reasonable procedures and directive to have prevented that from happening? And if, if you can't show that you've got that culture and you've got that governance and you've got that tone at the top and that you monitor it, then the company is liable. Um, I think that what ECTA does is that it doesn't just widen that to economic crime, you know, it, which it does. Um, fraud offences are much more prevalent than bribery offences, so it will be a much more everyday tool. But to the point that one of the panellists made, it also brings in a new identification principle. And so senior managers now can find the corporate and it's much wider than where we were you know, with members of the board so those people that have got significant roles in managing an organization's activities will be duty holders and can bind the corporate. So I think it's going to flip even more corporate governance on business in order to show that they've got those procedures in place. Otherwise, corporate is going to be liable. And is this connected or related anyway to the Dear CEO letter, which came out in the space of trade and banks doing trade and, and working capital funds? I mean, I think that's, yes. and that, that's undoubtedly correct. But I think it's also part of a bigger sort of move to failing to prevent offences. You know, the government seemed to like this idea of making corporates police themselves rather than them having to come in from scratch and sort of build a case. You know, it's now sort of almost a reverse burden of a corporate has to show what it's got in place to have prevented it. What does it mean for many of the banks in this room? <laughs> I mean, just in terms of doing things that they're not doing today, do you see there's going to be a wave of actions that take place within the market? And well, I imagine most banks will have extremely sophisticated processes in place in terms of anti-bribery, anti-money laundering. I mean, particularly anti-money laundering. And so there probably be there probably will be working groups that will be developing and uh, and using what's already been put in place in order to go for economic crime. So I, I don't think that it is starting from scratch. But you know, the th if you look at the number of offences that's covered in this new um, ECTA offence, you know, it, it covers everything from um, false accounting to fraud by misrepresentation to trading whilst insolvent to sanctions violations to money laundering to in the regulated sector FISMA offences you know it, it, it is a huge thing and so whereas bribery is relatively limited you know in terms of its scope and how it's done I think the challenge will be applying it to the wide variety of offences that can be committed under economic crime. And from a bank's point of view, is, is that putting extra pressure and extra costs on, on a business which is already probably creaking a little bit from some arcane processes? Well, that may be so, but I think Todd, one of the panellists, made a very good point that, you know, that's where technology and digitalization can come in. Because if that can do base layers, then it frees up human resources and other resources in order to, you know, to be put towards some of these other things. I mean, digitalization and AI is absolutely the way forward in terms of both economic growth, both in terms of compliance and creating systems in order to detect things. But what it can't do is then act upon the information that, that provides. Mm -hmm. And that's where the cultural piece, I think, is still, you know, much, very much within the grasp of human beings and what they do with the information. Yeah. And I know David at the beginning was talking about some of these issues and some of the risks dating back three, 4,000 years <laughs> almost. But um, do you see the prevalence of paper, which still exists within trade, and many of the banks that you'll talk to are probably sort of paper-driven processes. Is that part of the 
issue? And if so, how much is, is it the cause? It, 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 I mean, it does seem with trade finance that paper does seem to be an ongoing issue. I mean, in, in my particular example, I mean, the amount of fraudulent bills of lading, invoices, you know, paper trails, which were almost sort of being treated as tick box because people weren't looking at them. They just wanted to see them attached to the file. You know, you know that that does seem to be a particular risk area here. Um, whereas, you know, all of the real information were in the transaction monitoring, where simple, you know, agreement criteria were not being met, and it was there to be acted upon. Yeah, fascinating. Okay. Um, we talked about technology. Um, you mentioned there that the <coughs> touched on technology in various forms as well. Um, are you aware of, or do you think that there's anything out there which is a silver bullet, or is it a combination of technologies, or how can it be best used to to get to the bottom of some of these issues within fraud? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a mixture, really, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can most businesses, most financial businesses will have sanctions monitoring tools. You know, that they'll have transaction monitoring tools. They will be developing, you know, sort of AI in order to do baseline checks or reviews. But it's what you do with that information, really. I mean, I think sanctions is obviously very important at the moment. I mean, it changes all the time and it's it's not a legal tool. It's not black letter law. If you commit a fraud, fraud's a fraud in any age, in any time. But sanctions change on a daily basis and they, you know, they're very much driven towards what the political will is. So, I mean, I think that is a particular challenge. At the moment. Um, we talked about the regulatory side before and uh, I think, Jai, you touched on it quite a lot uh, during the panel session where on the payment side, there's a lot of understanding of the nature of the issue a lot of understanding of the quantification of it as well, what banks need to be doing. And if you look at some of the um, European regulations, it works really honing in on that. Is there enough on the trade side, either a domestic or an international basis, or can the trade side learn anything from what's happened on the payment side and governments and industry together? I mean, I think, I think the payment side is different. I mean, the example that Jaya sort of raised, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, you know, that whole compensation scheme um, for banks, you know, I think it's up to eighty-five thousand pounds. It, it is very much driven towards um, the domestic market and the retail sector because it's there to protect more vulnerable investors and and people with monies in banks. As to whether that translates across to something which applies easily to the trade finance space, I mean, I think it's it's more difficult. Um, I think, other than the regulation that the government is bringing out with things like ECTA and it's more a question of what those trade finance banks do with the information that they have. I mean, I go back to the point that I've already made, really. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to understand what you think in terms of whether the government, what, what regulation government can provide that, that can assist trade finance banks in that space. I'll come back to that one. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I do think you're right on the vulnerable side. Yeah. Um, so we can't boil the ocean at the same time and, and fix everything for the big guys. And the big guys can take it, whether they're a big multinational or whether that takes a loss given to them by the bank or whether a bank takes that as well. Um, but I think the previous government and the current mm -hmm. government on their agendas have promoting trade mm -hmm. and the promotion of trade, especially into the SME sector to get that moving. Uh, and there's a lot of companies in there that aren't really aware of how to get into those markets and the risks that they're entering into. Fraud's one of those risks. There are a number of other risks as well. But if, they, if their P&L can be taken out with one deal, basically, which goes wrong, you know, if they're shipping and not getting the money back, it's effectively a charity. So, you know, in terms of understanding and being able to protect some of those, I think it's probably worthwhile that the government does come in and encourage people to get to the bottom of it, especially for those. Um, the payment regulation change from a certain amount to a certain amount in a certain time, because banks are dragging their heels and saying, okay, I'll pay up maybe in a few years, but uh, now it's five days, I think. So, you know, I think they've protected a lot of the vulnerable people on the retail side, but there's probably space for that, especially on the SME side and working out if you're trying to promote that sector and to take out some of the key risks, which we saw were material before in that space. I mean, if it's, there's an event aspect, which is if you lose some money, it's bad enough, but there's also a fear factor as well of going into those markets. And it's just easier to do stuff at home. But if you want to unlock that international nature, then I think there needs to be some good links between that and not just being regulated from the government on their own, but also then with the industry and the banks in here as well, because you know, if it's too risky and people don't understand it and you lose money, you end up pulling your liquidity from that part of the market, which is not what we're trying to do, basically, for a big banking duo. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, especially on the SME space. I mean, that's, that's the middle sort of house between vulnerable retail and large scale that can take the loss in the short term, whilst trying to bring it back to the long term. So, yeah.
I'm going to give you one more question in a second, but just we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, we've got a few minutes left, so uh, after this, but final question from me. Um, one piece of advice to the banks that you might think would be worthwhile for them when they're addressing this going forward? More procedures, more policies? No, I think more, more monitoring. Um, you know, I think that a lot of banks, are very, you know, most banks are extremely sophisticated with these systems. And it's just a question of, you know, what the culture of the institution is. And when you have the information, what you do with it. So no more layers necessarily. Just well, sometimes you can have got. too many layers and then you just get lost in, yeah. in systems and bureaucracies. I mean, I mean, if, if you think about what the sort of tonality is around the Bribery Act and what is now on ECTA, it, it's all about adequate and reasonable procedures. And what regulators and enforcement agencies don't want to see is a tick box culture. We've got these layered processes. Okay, great. How does that, you know, sort of apply to your geographical risk, your commodity risk, your customer risk? You know, what are you doing practically in terms of what your business does and where it operates and where the risks are and what you do that's real life to your business? And those are the things they want to hear. So, I mean, th that requires the human elements above and beyond the technology elements. And so, for, for my money, I mean, I think that's where people can always be better. Mm. Keep it real, basically. Yeah. And don't get too close. Yeah. Almost too much KYC. Yeah. Well, you, you can get too, too drawn up in systems yeah. where, you know, you've got the paper, but what does the paper say? And what do you do then? True. Okay, good. That's enough from me. I'm going to open it up to some questions of James Riley straight away uh, <laughs> <laughs> from the audience. We'll get a microphone. Thank you. Um, I think Mike mentioned uh, in the conversation, fascinating, I think it really is, um, when you've got a potential fraud, when um, if a beneficiary in LC is trying to defraud your client, your interests are aligned with your client, mm -hmm. it's much easier to kind of um, escalate that and take some action because you're in agreement with your client. When your client has um, turned to the dark side and you don't know whether it's Anakin anymore and um, that confusing moment, um, like you say, you might have some um, breaches on the facility. And uh, from your experience, kind of any lessons learned, um, the only way that I've seen it in the past is um, once the breach occurs and there has to be a formal interview, um, the client has to put it right or else the terms are renegotiated. If it happens again, then the next layer. But then you've always got that positive bias of it's been a client for 20 years. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so that is just so difficult for the organisation to say, um, our trusted customer isn't trusted anymore and it's a very difficult moment. It, it doesn't happen very often. It, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. I mean, and, and I don't underplay that. I mean, that's precisely what happened in yeah. this case. Is You know, they'd been a successful and loyal customer for 10 years. Yeah. And although when we got to court, it was painted as a prolonged fraud because it lasted all year, in the grand scheme of things, a business starting to go wrong in the space of 12 months when it's done extremely well for 10 years is a relatively short period of time particularly when you're trying to work out, has this gone wrong and to what extent it's gone wrong? But I think the point, there, there comes a pivot point, doesn't there? When if your transaction monitoring report is saying it's happened again this month and the explanations still are the same or they don't add up or, you know, you're not being easily allowed to, to, to monitor stock. And, you know, there then comes a point when, you know, you have to make a decision. Do, do I want to carry on with this or is it happening too often? It, it breaches of the agreement, you know, too much. I'm being palmed off here, and so we need to recenter this. How you do that is, is extremely difficult, but you know, I mean, I, I, and I think that's the hardest thing to do. But in, in the combination here, I mean, the irony is, is that the warnings were in the statutory audit report, the warnings were in the internal audit reports and transaction monitoring reports, and if somebody had been bold uh, and, and sat down with them earlier, then you could have limited it at a much earlier stage and probably recouped probably most of the losses. I imagine some of the financiers left the relationship. Um, if it can't have been just five for the whole time, perhaps there were more that saw these signs and then took the right action and exited. Well, that's what caused the loss of liquidity uh, in 2012. Yeah. I mean, some of them realised earlier that I don't want to be part of this. And so they then avoided the trap that the other five got into. Thank you. It's how, how not to be left holding the baby. Yeah, quite. To the tune of $350 million. Indeed, indeed. Any more questions here for Dylan? It's a great opportunity to ask questions and you won't be billed. <laughs> we'll even get some drinks after it as well. So. Um, just focusing on lesser credit, I think we all understand that banks have an obligation to make payment against uh, facially compliant documents. I think there's a dilemma there because um, if you're an intermediary bank, like a nominated bank or a confirming bank, then if a 
presentation appears to be in order, facially compliant, and the payment is made if the bank has acted in good faith and not been negligent. The issue often arises is what is negligence? Because when the issuing bank, for, ex for example, receives the documents, fraud is found in the underlying presentation. And of course, the nominated bank in that case has already made the payment. Mm -hmm. So what are the legal remedies in such situations as to stop the beneficiary from receiving the proceeds or being able to release the proceeds. We took a Moravia injunction for asset freezing. How effective is that across cross-border jurisdictions? I mean, I, th I think that's a very interesting point in terms of intermediary banks. Um, you know, they'll be far less um, knowledgeable of what's happening in terms of any sort of breaches of agreements. And if the documents are presented on the face of it, they look to be complete, then you'd expect to sort of act upon that transaction in good faith. So, I mean, I think, I think that does cause a problem. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that, particularly from a criminal standpoint. I, I think it's more a question of when banks are on notice that they're, they're not in line with what the agreed terms are. So you might have the documents presented, but they're presented late, or some of them are not quite right. You know, it, it's, it's more that issue, really, that, that, that I've seen, where you, know, you don't have that suite of compliance where on the face of it, it looks right. There are warning signs, and the warning signs have been ignored. Um, and then and then you can look to, you know, a suite of different things as to what you do. In the first instance, I think, to the point that this gentleman made, you know, the, the point is to sort of sit them down and to, to ask people, well, what's going on here? And to have a conversation to sort of assess what the risk is and then to, you know, build in layers of audit. There might be layers of audit which are within the contract. Most supply agreements have audit rights in order to, you know, sort of to look into the books of the company and 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 ask to 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 be able to to go with those audit rights, you know, to you know to say, well, if we're going to continue this facility, or you know, I'm concerned about how this is acting. I want to audit how the stock is working, how the transactions are, are, are working. It doesn't stack with what we're getting, and so you know that would be an instance, you know, in terms of negligence and in terms of any litigation or in terms of any criminal risk that you could point to. Well, we have actively monitored this. You know, when, when red flags have arisen, we've taken X, Y, and Z steps, and we've, we've built in this assurance, we've got an audit trail, and we're looking at this in real time. And therefore, if things have gone wrong, it's not through want of our processes, and it's not through want of us act, you know, monitoring on a real you know, sort of basis. So it's, I mean, those kind of things. I think to go back to where we started, I think on your point, when you're in the intermediary, if you don't have any of those red flags because you're not that close to the underlying transaction, then, you know, I think it's very difficult. I think it's very difficult both to understand that there might be a fraud, but equally it's probably even more difficult to, to accuse you of any negligence because you've acted upon the presentation of, of a good suite of documents. So, I mean, I, I hope that globally sort of gives you some view of to where I stand on that. Yeah, just to add to that as well, and I think the regulators changed their tune years ago now, which was every bank was used to dealing with what they had, what was presented to them, dealing with documents and not goods. And I remember that one from a long time ago here. Um, and they basically said, that's not enough. You've got to do that. So you've got to know where things have come from and where things are going. You have the obligation. So if you're part of that food chain and you're making money on it as an agent in the middle of that, you can't just say, I can't see it. Therefore, I'll just pass it along and I'll still take my dollar when it comes in, um, however integrated you are in that process. So I think the responsibility to know who's involved to as much degree as possible across that food chain. And I remember when the regulations came out years ago and the, and the bank says, we can't do that. We don't do that. We'll never be able to do it and the answer was basically do it basically and if you can't do it you know leave the scenario basically and, and leave it to people that will because the, the the slaps on the wrist didn't become weren't slaps on the wrist forever the fines that came in on these trade transactions were were massive and i remember them going from sort of 50 million dollars very quickly post 9 11 to sort of 200s 500s 1 billion type of dollars so they had to wake up and actually do something about it so if you're part of that food chain it's an obligation on you to understand as much as you can what's going on, where it's coming from and where it's going to. So the documentation side and the rules and trade, which protect to a certain degree and not the be-all and end-all, because the regulators have a slightly different view on things. Well, I think that's what happened on the Zenrock and Quindao cases, because I think part of the litigation there, some of the findings were, was that some of the banks' conduct was not clean and that they were aware of some of the risk and hadn't passed that on in the chain. Even worse. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm conscious we've got drinks outside. We've got a couple of questions. Jay, first, you'll go. Very interesting. Thank you. I completely understand the culture point and especially enabling a culture of speaking up and acting on it. But 
talking about collaboration Ali, I'm just wondering within that case, at some point, do you think there could have been a collaborative effort that could have flagged this risk? So every bank having some warning signs, individually ignoring it, but as a collective, we could have spotted it? Yeah, I mean, I've wondered that over the years as well. I mean, they were all sufficiently aware of each other as trading banks trading to that business. But then, you know, there would have been confidentiality obligations. Um, there would have been probably safeguarding their own interests with the relationship. Um, there would have been an embarrassment about talking about these issues. Um, and so I, I think in a particular factual nexus, it's very difficult to understand how they would have talked about it on a more sort of macro level, you know, the industry talking about the issues, you know, I think that that's much easier. Um, the industry is quite incestuous. I'm pretty sure that they were all talking to each other about the trades. <laughs> Could they have been more open with one another? Probably. Um, but I do, I, I, do, I do see the problem around confidentiality and protecting, you know, some client interests and client relationship, which probably precluded more open conversation. There's a lesson there. I think protecting one issue, there's an un, like confidentiality that has been unintended consequences elsewhere. So I think that's probably what's not been realised at first, which but becomes apparent later on, basically, but needs to be addressed equally. Um, I'm going to take one more because I'm conscious that we're running over time. We need to hand it back to David. Um, Jane, did you have another one? Sorry. Not a quick question. So there was a recent news story uh, in Singapore where... Um, recent news story in Singapore where the court uh, ruled in favor of two banks, I think the exposure was around 60 million, where the LOI was issued under um, <clears throat> the um, Copy BL. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gas oil traders, these were very small traders that issued the, the Copy BL and it turned out that the documents were incomplete or falsified. So the banks refused to pay. Fortunately, the, bank, the, um, the court ruled in favor of the banks, but issued a reminder that the bank should check the documents beforehand. But it's obviously a challenge with LOIs, right, given that, you know, the, the copy BL might only be available to, to verify again. So I just wanted to get your view on that, if that's an emerging theme. Um, LOIs used to be something that, you know, the more established traders used to issue. But now it's becoming more uh, a trend for smaller uh, traders to also issue them. So yeah. just your view on that. As to whether there should be more... It's an emerging risk theme that you yeah. should be wary about. Um, and if, if you haven't heard of it, then that's fine. But just I, wanted to. I, mean, I, I don't have a sort of deep knowledge of how the banks check it, but I mean, uh, or what the expectation is on the level of paperwork for different lenders at different times. But, you know, should they be checking the, the BOLs on top of with the LOIs? Probably yes, particularly if they've got audit rights around it. I mean, I think all of the things, all of the themes to these things are if you've got audit rights, if you've got the ability to check things, if you've got concerns, if there are red flags. What have you done practically in order to mitigate that risk? Because that's what a court's going to look at. It's going to look at, did you just blindly take that on faith? Or did you have the ability to investigate that further? Did red flags arise? Did you act you know, responsibly or did you act negligently? So I think you sometimes businesses are embarrassed to exercise their audit rights and they shouldn't be. Perhaps the reason why they won the case. In this case, the banks exactly. won the case. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. I'm going to call it time there. There is uh, the drinks afterwards as well. Give another opportunity for people to ask any more questions if you're staying around, Dylan. Hopefully, yeah. Again, unbilled. So take it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much for your questions, and thanks very much for your input on the Slido questions. That's very very useful to the uh, to the ICC and everybody else involved in this initiative. So if I could hear it for uh, Dylan, thanks everybody. <laughs> And on that note, just handing it back now over to Dave. Dave, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me, Mike? There we go. Yes, thanks. Over to you, Dave. Excellent. Well, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. This was a superb cross-section of experts with some fascinating insights. And but as we conclude this masterclass on, uh, on forward in trade finance, I'd just like to offer a few closing thoughts. I, I spoke in my introduction about fraud during the ages, going back 4,000 years. And in the, the 20th and 21st centuries, technology advancements and globalization have further transformed trade finance. If we look at the use of electronic funds transfers, digital solutions, and trade-based money laundering, it's become more widespread. And I think the fact is understanding the history of fraud in trade finance highlights the need for robust regulatory frameworks, advanced technological solutions, 
and a vigilant approach to mitigated risks. And as, as trade continues to evolve, as it is and it will, so too must the methods to prevent and address fraud, ensuring the integrity of global commerce. Falling trade finance does still remain a significant challenge, but our collective efforts are making a difference. Throughout this masterclass, we've explored several critical aspects. Chris and his panel provided us with a lot of input and discussion on the recommendations to government from the Trade Digitalization Task Force. And Mike and Dylan have discussed some real life fraud cases and their impacts. We all know fraudsters continually adapt their tactics, highlighting the need for constant vigilance and innovation in our prevention strategies. The, the risk of digital technologies presents new risks, but similarly, it actually provides us with enhanced opportunities to combat fraud. And a key theme for me is the importance of collaboration. And I was so glad to see, based upon the Slido exercise that Mike ran, that you agree. Tackling fraud effectively requires partnership between financial institutions, regulators, law enforcement, and technology providers. We need to share information, best practices, resources. It's crucial to stay ahead of the of sophisticated fraud schemes. Uh, Todd Burwell mentioned earlier getting intel, and I fully support and reinforce his observation. We talked about technology during this session. Emerging technologies like AI and data analytics can be powerful allies in fraud detection and prevention. However, we must also remain aware of how criminals may exploit these same technologies. So just to close, I'll leave you with four messages. As you return to your organizations, I encourage you, one, to review and strengthen your fraud prevention frameworks. Two, foster partnerships within and outside your institutions. Thirdly, continue to invest in staff training to recognize red flags and emerging fraud trends. And fourthly, stay informed about regulatory developments and industry best practices. Just remember that our efforts not only protect financial assets, but also prefer, preserve the integrity of global trade systems. By working together and staying vigilant, we can make significant strides in reducing fraud and build even more trust in trade finance. So thank you for your active participation and the valuable insights that's been shared during this masterclass, very valuable for us. Let's continue to collaborate and innovate in our ongoing fight against trade finance fraud. And of course, as Mike said, enjoy the networking drinks. Thank you very much.